Welcome to the Ask Brian Podcast Radio Show, where you'll hear from some of the most successful founders and CEOs of businesses and startups, sharing their best advice for success, and even some stories on how their mistakes actually make them even more successful. Now, here are your hosts, Brian and Tracy. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Wow, that is loud. Okay, we're back for 2021. Goodbye, 2020. Good riddance. Sorry, guys, but I just did not have a very good time with COVID and all the other problems we had. Let's have a better, better year, 2021. You're listening to the Ask Brian radio show on KHS 1220 and 98.1 FM. Now, for people that have not listened to the Ask Brian show, a couple of things. One, we started our first show in 2017. Pilot was in December of 2016. But uh, we've been around for a few years, and every week, Ask Brian tries to bring on board somebody as a guest that has some business background that can help you in business. So if you listen to all the shows, you'll eventually become a business expert by Listening to every show, you'll get information that can help you out in your business. Ask Brian is spelled A-S-K-B-R-I-E-N.com. And every year, if you haven't listened to the show, people are always asking, why do you spell Brian B-R-I-E-N? Because when I went to school, I had a friend, Brian B-R-Y-A-N and B-R-I-A-N. I, the only Brian I knew was an Irishman named O'Brien. So... I have the engineer, and that does start with an E, so give me other reasons why. <laughs> da, 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 da. Where's your drum roll? You, you know, need a drum roll. I wonder, you know what? I wonder if I can find a drum roll. I think I well, can. Well, it's a little here. bit too late now. You know, you well, you know, what? You know, I'll bring it in. For the next show. <laughs> next <laughs> show. All right. Fine, fine, fine. Fair enough. That's my homework. But hey, everybody, the engineer here, and he took my thunder away by taking my favorite of the E's. He took the engineer E, because it does start with an E, but... Either way, that Th- starts with an and, E as and well. And thunder is from Grease Lightning, remember? <laughs> Easy, Danny Zuko. Uh, <laughs> anyways. Brian there, Zuko to you. <laughs> Brian Zuko. Either way, there's a couple of uh, words that start with an E that uh, kind of embody uh, the Ask Brian show. Uh, one of them is um, excellence because uh, we all here exude nothing but excellence uh, on, on the show. Uh, experts would be another one because uh, we have everybody that is on our show is an expert in some form of field uh, that we're bringing them in for. Other ones we have is empathy, which he was not being very empathetic with me by, you know, stealing my thunder on that one. Uh, let's see, that's that's three, plus mine was the four. I believe there is a effort, because we give 100, uh, 100% effort on everything we do on this show. Uh, I think there's... Let's get excited! He brought the excitement. I was going to say enthusiasm, but he's got that too. Because you can have persistence, but if you don't have enthusiasm, if you're not enthusiastic and excited about what you're doing, it's a lot tougher. Very true. And I think that does it, right? I'm sure there's three or four others, but we don't have time to make a three-hour show <laughs> while the engineer goes back in time to figure out what's going on. <laughs> it's been a while. It's been a long vacation. And if anybody wants to, they can go to the Ask Brian website, www.askbrian.com. We have our shows posted there, as well as any business questions, business answers you need, as well as any experts are all on the Ask Brian website. And without any further ado, how do you spell ado? A-D-I-E-U. And why do I like that? Because it's got a lot of vowels in there. Yes! I trained you well. Okay. I'm giving a little fish to the seal. You can eat it now. <laughs> Terrible. And we have our co-host, Tracy. Are you there? Oh, I'm here. <laughs> I didn't want to forget you, you know. Um, and then we have our... Well, I kind of thought you did. I was starting to get my New Year's feelings hurt. I was like, gosh, am I already going to get my feelings hurt this quickly? I don't think so. Surely they didn't forget about me. <laughs> That's because we're empathetic. <laughs> yes, yes, and encouraging, and enlightening, and all of those wonderful things. And we have a we have a very good guest today, Tom Neely. Yes, sir. All right, how you doing, sir? Good, good. I hope I can keep up with you guys. All you guys have great radio voices. Here I am with my nasally post-COVID voice. Well, that's because we're... Oh, like, but, you, but you have intellect we don't have. You have intellect. <laughs> <laughs> Speak for yourself, Tracy. 
I will. Thank you. <laughs> so, Tom. Um, yes, sir. We want to go a little bit about your background. Nobody knows, you know, much about you. So, give us a little ba- a biographical background. You know, I'm not. I don't want a, uh, you know, a, a boring type one, but just give me a couple background. Give, give me some pointers of things that you've done in the past and where you are today. Well, where do you want me to start? Should we start after in... your, after the newspaper route? Okay. After the newspaper route. Well, <laughs> so that would be somewhere in the principal's office in junior high school. In the 1930s? Okay, go ahead. In the 1970s, so yeah. (laughs) Basically, uh, my turn at uh, entrepreneurialism was by necessity when I was, uh, right when I got out of high school in 84, um, I was uh, trying to get into automotive design school over at Pasadena Art Center, and I was going to Glendale College, a community college locally, trying to fatten up the portfolio, and it was futile to get in with, unless you had money. Uh, so you had to have a great portfolio to get into Pasadena Art Center. A lot of people are familiar with that school. It's the number one automotive design school. Anyway, long story short, I was sitting there in art class one day, drawing a picture of a guy in a loincloth eating fruit, and I just decided it probably wasn't for me, and uh, quit school after one semester of college, and went home, told my parents, hey, I quit school, and... The following morning, I woke up with a three-day notice on my bedroom door. <laughs> and, you know, at 18 years old, you, you've never seen a three-day notice. You don't know what that is. I'm 56, and, and I still haven't seen one, but go ahead. This is what? I said I'm 56 years old, and I haven't seen one yet. But oh, okay, well, <laughs> yeah, so I'm 54, so we're about the same age. So um, I was working part-time at a paint and body shop. And uh, I was making minimum wage. Minimum wage at the time was uh, $3.50, if you, if you remember back that far. And uh, my mom, with this three-day notice, she put the rent at $200. So I went down to where I was working part-time. I told my boss, hey, I need to work full-time. And he said, uh, I don't need you full-time. You have no skills. You know, part-time's all I need you for to do the banking, run the banks, uh, deposits in, take customers home. That's all I need you for. And I begged him and begged him. And... He said, if I could undercut the illegal aliens and go down to $3 an hour cash, I could take the job full time. So I took it. I convinced him he had to buy me lunch. I convinced him he had to drive me to work because he lived nearby me and I would ride my bike home because $200 at that time just seemed like expensive to me. So long story short, my mom kept ratcheting up the pressure. You know, she made me start buying my own food. My dad was just sitting there as a bystander. He didn't intervene and my mom's... uh, pressure tactics and uh, eventually my mom had gotten me to pay my rent pay my own car insurance and pay for my own food and pay my own phone bill and so (laughs) that was a lot of money back then I don't know if you remember car insurance wasn't what it is now it was much more expensive back then for a kid uh, with 16 speeding tickets (laughs) and so so it was pretty ugly (laughs) it was pretty ugly you know what is that 200 points Oh, back then they didn't they didn't suspend kids' licenses like they do now. I mean, now if they just look at a traffic cop wrong, you know, they get their license pulled. But back then we got away with so much stuff. Like, I still can't believe how much we got away with in those days. Because we didn't have the internet. <laughs> we didn't have the internet. Yeah, and there was no outrage. There was no outrage no of kids social, being kids. No social media. <laughs> but anyway, so I worked for this guy for about eight nine months. Made it up to four or five bucks an hour. Made it up eventually to about eight bucks an hour within a year, and then decided to just open my own body shop and uh, paint body shop and work my way through that and then I had always raced cars as a young kid in organized racing and eventually it just kind of transitioned from paint and body into automotive uh, construction and prototype construction and car design and car fabrication and then we got into distributing the parts that we put on the cars and that grew into a large distributorship and then you know what 40 years later how long has it been how long ago was 1985 35 years ago 35 years ago so 35 years ago we're kind of sitting at the top of uh of our little neck of the woods in the economy and things are good it's been a long long road a lot of a lot of life lessons learned along the way and basically started that business with about 265 bucks and you probably have a little bit more than that now yeah, we're doing okay. We're 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 the third largest in our industry, and uh, we're doing real well. Well, what Things I find good. what I find interesting is you went to college for automotive design, 
And then uh, a couple years later, after you were in business for a while, you were actually doing some of that with the, the race cars, correct? Yeah, we were. I was trying to get into automotive design. I couldn't get in to Pasadena Art Center without a fat portfolio. So I was trying to build the portfolio, and I actually convinced the counselor there to let me sit on on some classes to help me fat my portfolio with non-credited art center classes. So it was a great deal for me. And uh, but I just couldn't afford the tuition. My parents weren't going to pay for my school because I screwed off in high school. I was a barely a C average student. I think. My GPA was 2.65, and uh, I did great in art and music. <laughs> that was about it. Everything else I kind of swept off and didn't pay attention to, but I just I just made it through somehow without getting uh, expelled. Well, the engineer says he wishes he had a 2.65. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. My, mind you, I had a 3.5 in high school. Mr. Of, Brian Johnson. Out of ten, okay. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. I tell I tell people that I do consultant work for because I do a little consultant work on the side for some private equity companies and some large manufacturing companies in the in the billion range to nine hundred million range. And they always ask me, you know, what university I went to and uh, what degrees I had. And I told them, I said, you know, expulsion, suspension, detention. I, wait, I thought you graduated the School of Hard Knocks. I did. They, they don't count that, but they think it's great. <laughs> but, you know, when you dig deep into some of the staff at some of these large corporations, you find out some of the sharpest people there were basically high school dropouts. It's kind of funny. Well, n- not only high school dropouts, but look at the college dropouts that we've had in recent years, multi-billionaires. You know, Bill Gates and uh, Zuckerberg, they were college dropouts. Uh, so you could compile a list, 10 rules to be a successful entrepreneur, and... I have that list in front of me, and we want to go through some of these items. So the first one you said for item number 10, and these in order of one being the most important, but 10 being the least important, and you write down, reduce your cost of living to the bare bones. So explain that to people. Well, the number one thing I run into when I'm mentoring other entrepreneurs and business owners that are younger than I am, which I do on a volunteer basis, I usually try to keep four to five uh, young minds on the speed dial just to help people out and kind of pass on some of the mentorship I was fortunate to have along the way. And the number one thing that comes up every time I'm dealing with someone who's short on cash, has to go to a bank for loan, is they live like they're already in business for 15, 20 years and they're making it. They live like they're making it. And, uh, you know, right down to the cell phone, the car they drive, the overhead they have for rent, you know, lack of roommates. I mean, people just live too expensively. And it's it's hard to not do that in Los Angeles, but you have to be creative. And that, that holds a lot of people back with capital. Okay, but, you know, we're talking about living, right? So, I mean, yeah, so maybe your rent is $2,000 versus $1,000 versus $3,000. Yes, $1,000 is a lot of money. But, I mean, to start a business nowadays, I would think you need a couple hundred thousand dollars to be very successful. So, uh why, why, why should that matter? Well, I don't think you need 200 grand to start a business. I think uh, if you've got a phone and you've got transportation, you can fit in somewhere. And I don't think you need to invest that much capital to start a business. Obviously, a restaurant would be a different story or, you know, say uh, a UPS store or some Baskin Robbins or buying a McDonald's or something like that. Obviously, you need money. But a lot of people start out, you know, say in construction and then they want to become their own contractor or they're an interior designer. These things that don't have a lot of overhead where you can kind of work from home to get your feet wet. You just got to reduce the overhead as much as possible. That also helps you weather storms like what we're in now. Uh, Corona storm. Um. (laughs) (laughs) Corona cloud. (laughs) Exactly. And um, Tracy, why don't you go with number nine? Um, Thanks for the curveball. Appreciate that. I always Um, like to throw you in the fire. (laughs) (laughs) I can take it. I can take it. Okay, so number nine, reject subsidies. They make your business model weak. List your own weight. Yeah, I'd love to hear your insight on this. This is actually one of my favorite. I'm his favorite. I'm his favorite. I'm his favorite. Who's a favorite? 
Me, because I read number nine, and it's your favorite. Oh, yeah, that is that is my favorite. Reject subsidies. <laughs> Reject your subsidizations as much as possible. It's hard in certain businesses because the government throws some money your way if you're in, say, you know, wind power or electric vehicles. I, I can understand that. They want to push, push something a certain direction. But I've noticed the people that rely on artificial subsidization they take their foot off the gas, for lack of a better metaphor. And I think that um, even myself, I caught myself, even with all the free money flying around from the SBA and the uh, stimulus and everything, I caught myself leaving 15 minutes early once in a while, which is unheard of. I never leave 15 minutes early from work, you know, because you know you've got a backup and a little safety net with this subsidization. It makes you weak. It makes you soft. It makes you take your foot off the gas, and if you're going to succeed, you've got to have your foot on the gas. Okay, so I have a question for you. You know, that's subsidy, but let's say you've been successful for 40 years. Let's say you have $5 million in the bank. You know, you didn't get a subsidy, but you got money now because you have been successful. Isn't that going to also t- tell you to take a little bit of, of the foot off the gas or not? Yeah, and you know, that's true, too. That is true, too, but you want to you want to reject that feeling as much as you possibly can. You need to keep pushing for the benefit of the company, your employees, and your everybody, everybody involved with you. They want you to keep your foot on the gas. Obviously, you can take Sundays off. That's okay. I allow that. But uh, that's it. Keep your foot on the gas. Well, I'm very grateful because I'm a big NFL fan, so I have to take off Sundays from... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Brian, let me, let me guess your team. You are a, no, you are a New York Giant. No, the other team. <laughs> the Jets? Yeah. J-E-T-S, Jets. Oh, you poor man. I was going to say Buffalo. Hey, excuse me, I watched, them beat, <laughs> I watched them beat the Rams a couple of weeks ago. I was yeah, that playing, was good. That was, my, that was funny. That like was our too. Super Bowl. <laughs> yeah, yeah they knocked me out of my eliminator pool, those Jets. <laughs> Don't mess with the Jets. Okay. Yeah, so anyway, that's my, that's my stance on that. All right, we're going to be going to a break in about a minute or two, so we're going to go over the number eight, and that is stand behind your product and your work even at your own financial demise. So what are you saying? If somebody says, I don't like your product, give me a refund, you refund them back? Is that what you're referring to or something else? Yeah, if, if you've uh, committed a warranty-capable uh, product, you need to stand behind it. If, if you're doing work or, say, it's a construction job or you're wiring somebody's house or whatever it is, you stand behind it, even if you got to take a loan out to cover the loss. You stand behind it. A lot of people now just feel like they're entitled and they do not stand behind their work. And that's creating a big problem in the marketplace. This is going to pop up even worse in the next 10 to 15 years. Well, what if you have a service, like you're a consultant, right? So let's say somebody was paying you money to be their consultant and they didn't like it. And they said, you know what? I'm paying you five grand a month. I don't like the coaching. I want my money back. Would you give them the money back? Well... If you feel that you breached the contract yourself, if you dig deep and you think you did that, then you're working for free. So you better, you know, pull your weight or you're working for free or you're refunding somebody. You've got to stand behind it. That also makes you weak if you do not do that. Well, what if you think you did a good service? Well, then you have a dispute, and that's where a lawyer like yourself comes in handy. All right. Are you there, Tracy? <sighs> I mean, one of my ear drums is here. The I, I, other, I, I, I yeah. think, is... I'm sorry, but I saw that my, okay. I, I, I actually had a winner there because the engineer kind of was like smoking it, so I had to just throw that. He was asleep at the little patty. Okay, let's get, that, let's get, Ow. Let's get back into this. Um, because number seven is that we have, um, it's so important and it's in a really good conversation to have around. So number seven, your number seven is for inventory-based businesses, you must control your inventory as carefully as you do anything else in the business. And my question is, okay, so help us if you are either a new business and you've never had an inventory-based business, but even more importantly, because this was my own personal struggle, so I'd love to have your insight on this, is being a service-based business and then adding inventory and converting from a service-based business to an inventory-based business, because that's a pretty sharp learning curve. Uh, before we go, yeah. I just want everyone to know we're, we're speaking here with Tom Neely, and he has created a list of 10 items that you need to be successful. We're on item number seven, in case you just joined us. Well, that learning curve of switching from service 
health base to inventory is one of the hardest things to do. You have to almost change your DNA because on the one hand, when you started your business, say you were uh, painting houses and you were doing stucco, let's say, and then all of a sudden you became a stucco and paint distributor. That's very hard for people to do. You have to be left and right, right brain to do that. The main thing is if you, let's say, what was your business, Tracy? What, what did you do? So I did, I specifically only did uh, consulting services. And so um, about a little over four and a half years ago, I launched a podcast production company that went from service-based to we managed uh, inventory around uh, equipment, podcast equipment and engineers and we increased labor and inventory. Okay, okay. So it used to just be me. I was like a solopreneur, and now I have a team all over the country with equipment inventory and people and labor, and it, it's a dramatically different business model. Yeah, that's very difficult with multiple locations. I'm, I'm only, I've only experienced two locations max of my own, but I can tell you, if you don't make it, you have to be close to it and only stock three months of it. So if you figure out you're going to sell 100 widgets a year, um, and you're not making your widgets, you want 33 widgets on the shelf at all times. If you're making your widgets, you may want to look at the profitability of manufacturing the widgets for up to three years of inventory on hand at any time because you're, you're taking the channel margin out of there. Channel is uh, what a distributor makes after he buys it from a manufacturer. You've eliminated the channel margin, and now you're the manufacturer direct to public. So you may want to consider doing three years of inventory on the shelf at all times. And it has proven for me to be another 15 points annually on the bottom, bottom line by manufacturing in that high a quantity. But that being said, a lot of the gen, uh, what is it, Generation Z and the millennial graduates from Harvard and Yale do not believe that. And uh, it's a boomer thing, it's a Gen X thing to have three years of inventory for a manufacturing business. Well, first of all, uh, beginning about just in time, but what about, you know, product discount, right? So, uh, yeah, three months and it's going to cost me $8, right? But if I buy uh, six months, I only have to pay $4. So, I mean, how does that affect it? Well, if, if, you, if you're manufacturing it and you're manufacturing a mass quantity for a hardware business, which is what I'm real familiar with, for hardware... The margins are so high that having three years of it on the shelf is about as much as three to six months of uh, distributed product on your shelf. It's about the same, and but a lot of people have a hard time dedicating that much manufacturing bandwidth to put three years of inventory on the shelf. But I have seen it done, and I've done it both ways, and I, I really believe in the three-year model as a manufacturer and as a distributor. I really believe in the three-month rule. Yes, yeah, so I, so I, what I was really seeing impacted in 2020 was basically, I think, a reality check of this rule, right? Because all of a sudden, everything's going along in our normal life, then the pandemic comes, and then people's supplies are drying up, and people don't have the inventory like they thought. So how would you say that, was that a big reality check for a lot of people as a result of the pandemic, and how do you think people have adjusted? Well, for me, my only, I can only speak from my own experience. I was in very good position. I had the three years on the shelf, and the, my two number one suppliers, they had three years on the shelf. So nobody had a dip. Everybody, it's business as usual, and all of our competition did it in just in time, JIT. And they are all suffering, going by the wayside, and eventually maybe going out of business. So we will be picking up the ashes of those uh, bonfires, hopefully here in the next year, and suck them into our operation. But the people that had three years on the shelf going into this uh, pandemic, they're doing really well. Well, with just in time, you don't have to worry about an inventory cost, right? You don't have to worry about, hey, I've got $50,000 worth of inventory. I'm not earning any money on it till I sell it. So there is a benefit to just in time. Yeah, I do it both ways. I, I have a portion that is JIT, and I have a portion that's manufactured. And uh, it's just one of those things. You have, to, you have to decide if you can trust your suppliers to have inventory for you at any given time. You've got to be close to your inventory, too. Walmart made a killing on that. They are 20 minutes away from all their inventory suppliers, or so the story goes. But it's something, it's something that needs to be combed through constantly. If you, it depends on the SKUs, too. I have over 85,000 SKUs. 
in my warehouse. So I have a wide, shallow lake of inventory. I don't have a hundred SKUs that are very deep. So for me, it's very hard to manage eighty to ninety thousand SKUs. I think anybody has <laughs> has that many SKUs. Yeah, <laughs> it's not that just, makes yeah. my learning curve. <laughs> It's, yeah, it's my running uh, curve feels very, very small right now. Very, very small. <laughs> Felt big, now feel small. <laughs> well, let's talk, let's talk about something that um, is a choice, but at the same time, not everybody makes this choice, and that's uh, uh, number six, which is be on Lombardi time and expect the same of your staff. Now, did you go and look up what Lombardi time is in pre-show preparation? Well, actually, no, I did not, but I'm very grateful for the fact that you enlightened me on with a break. (laughs) (laughs) And and if anybody who knows me knows me, then the reason is that um, because I do have punctuality issues, and um, unless I'm going to a movie, live on the radio, or have a spa appointment, otherwise, that just shows you that I know how to be on time for priorities. (laughs) That's good, that's good. Well, Lombardi time, you can Google it. It's a very popular concept. Uh, Vince Lombardi obviously started this in the, in the 60s when he was coaching the Packers. And it's basically you're 15 minutes late, or 15 minutes early, excuse me, 15 minutes early for everything, and you expect the same from everybody. If you're on time, you're late. 50 minutes early everywhere. And, and your life will change accordingly. Yeah, so my husband and Vince Lombardi must be peers because that's his <laughs> motto is that if you're on time, you're late. And then he also talks very significantly and frequently about how you have to allow for extra time because you don't know what will happen in between when you leave and when you get to said destination. Oh, yeah, especially in L.A. County. I mean, if you want to be legitimate, you really need to be on double Lombardi time, be a half hour early everywhere. So if you get stuck on that 405, you're covered. And you probably don't want to work for the government. <laughs> 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 they're, they're 15 years late but um, we have number 5 on his list of entrepreneur I love this one empower your employees to become wealthy working for you businesses that pay well also do well and employees that are incentivized will work as hard as the owner the owner will prosper only if their employees are prospering yes yes Yes, and yes. I, I, yeah. I, I have one point I want to ask you, and it's part of the sure. question is, so do you believe in employee ownership, and do you believe in stock options are mandatory if you have a corporation? Uh, are, are those the type of things you're referring to, or that's not part of it? I like that in a lot of, a lot of cases, yeah. For small business, uh, under 10 or 20 employees, I don't know if that works, but I know for larger companies, uh, I think it's very good. And I think it incentivizes people. But I can tell you, the one of the biggest compliments, or, or I shouldn't say compliment, one of the greatest moments of satisfaction of my tenure as a CEO and employer is when I see my employees pulling in my parking lot with brand new cars and I, that they paid for. Not that they borrowed money to buy, but they actually paid for. And they haven't and, embezzled you either. <laughs> and they have not embezzled me, no. <laughs> No, that's, oh, that's horrible. <laughs> but I, I love it. I see, I see my my uh, employees. Their kids are going to private schools. They're driving new cars, and you have to put a piece of the action on the table for them to get involved. And you will see a great deal of difference in how your people perform. Is it's, there, it's the, do you have a recommendation on those percentages, though? I, I was mean, just going to ask the same the, thing. What, what percentage? Do you range those that? percentages? Yeah. Well, what I like to do is um, I like to look at the bottom line for the year, and I like to divvy it, up, divvy it up equally after everybody got their base salary. That's what I like to do. And so what about hourly employees and things like that? Are you, are you talking about just salary yeah. executives? No, or everybody. About across the board? Everybody. Everybody gets a hunk. Everybody gets a hunk, and so everybody's working hard. And then you also lay out performance milestones for them, too, like if they can learn how to do this, if they can learn how to do a pivot table in Microsoft Excel, if they can learn Magento 2 platform, if they can do this, they can do that, they'll start making more. It's not just about the bonus at the end of the year, but it's about your your wage and your salary. The more you know how to do, and then you're much better off for the company, and more people are inclined to learn all that if they know they're getting immediate pay for that. So, so your incentives are based on income and, and et cetera, but 
Oh, what about giving employees a percentage? Because when you give employees percentage, then you come back to that other issue we just talked about earlier, whereas the subsidy issue, right? So let's say we gave somebody 2% of the company, right? And now that that money, you know, now that there's two issues there. One is they've got that extra income coming in, and so they don't need to work as hard, potentially. Or two, they leave the company and they try to take that 2% with them, and ha-ha, I'll be at the beach, you work, you're, you work and, and, and I'll hang out. So how does that You know, work? I've never had that problem. I, I would say, for lack of a better metaphor, the incentivization is a carrot in, in front. You're chasing that carrot, and you're going to get the carrot at the, at the end of the, of the trip, where a subsidization would be me shoving the carrot down your throat and chewing it for you. You know, you don't even have to work for it. So... For lack of a better metaphor, that's all I can really think of off the top of my head. All right. So, uh, Tracy, you want to go number five? Oh, yes, because I'm a big advocate of this as well. We are. We have a lot of the same business philosophy, so that, hopefully that means I'm going to be as successful as you are. So, answer your phone. Eliminate your voicemail system entirely. Return all calls and emails the same day. So, I actually have had people be shocked. I have on my website, um, There's a you can click to talk, and it goes, it actually doesn't go to an email or voicemail system. It goes straight to my cell phone. And so, I have... When I've an- and I've answered it, and people are they stammer and stutter because they're not expecting to get the founder <laughs> of the company. They're like, oh, no, no, "Well, you're the yeah," and I'm like, "No, nope, you're talking to Tracy. This is her." So I love that that's your philosophy. Now, I will ask you though: What if it's just virtually impossible to return an email the same? I do definitely return calls on the same day, but emails the same day are. That can be challenging, and it also sets up expectations, but it sounds like... Um, well, within reason. I mean, if it's 501, you're not returning that email till you're back at, you know, 8 a.m. the next day. So you understand, like, during the middle of the day, don't leave anything unfinished. And they eliminate the voicemail system. That is something I only recently got turned on to. A very, very large uh, steel supplier of Los Angeles ripped the entire phone system out of their building and gave everybody two lines. You either got one guy on hold or you're talking to another guy. No more voicemail because with the voicemail, you got to take down the guy's number. Then you got to start chasing the guy that left you the message. You're playing phone tag in it and it just saps your uh, your processes and it just it's a, it's a time waster. So if anyone's leaving you a voicemail, it's just a, it's just a waste of time. You want to call them. And they want they got to call you, and everybody answers. Yes, and it's great. I mean, because I'm just sorry, but it's you know the it's overrated, it's, it's underrated how important a phone conversation can be, and how things can get lost in translation with email going back and forth. I mean, oh yeah, you email, can, email is terrible. Email is terrible. It's 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 horrible. Messaging and emails, it, it's terrible. You need to pick up your phone, have a conversation with somebody, and and ask them to do the same. And it, that's a that is a lost art. That is fading away fast with the changes in society. Society. We have about a minute and a half, yeah. left, Tracy, for number four. Well, and I will, but I will say also, lost art of the handwritten note, too, by the way. That's another thing. And so gratitude, especially gratitude for a handwritten note, is more important than people realize, and it makes a huge difference. So, number three, to be an effective leader, you must prove to your staff that you're willing to do the grunt work and dirty work yourself. Never send a man in to do a job, or a woman, in to do a job that you are not willing to do yourself. Amen. And I just say amen because it means so be it. It doesn't mean a man. It means Let's not go there. Let us not go there. I do not want to start that one. So somebody's been watching the news lately. Somebody's been watching the news. (laughs) <laughs> well, that one speaks for itself, obviously. I think that uh, one of the problems I also run into with people trying to do a business or start a business with excessive overhead for life, they also try to act like, uh, you know, King Arthur there in the chair with a turkey leg and a, and a sword and just direct everybody to do things and, you know, they don't lift a finger. That is a great way to get people to start looking on uh, ZipRecruiter.com for the next job. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of information we've been getting in the last uh, 45 minutes. We've got about another four or five minutes left. And Tom Neely, our guest, has compiled a list of 10 things that you need to be a successful entrepreneur. We've gone through the first seven uh, or eight. We have two left. And Jermo, I- I'm sorry, you know, the engineer is kind of slow. Thank you. 
<laughs> Number two, Tracy, go. Number two, recessions are where the best prepared business owners will grow beyond normal economic conditions. Do not, I repeat, do not get sucked into the false narrative of the marketplace. Best advice ever in number yep. two. Yep. So how do you want me to explain that? Let's see. So you turn on the news, which I try not to do, and you see that uh, the market's down, people are jumping out of buildings on Wall Street, and, and the, everything's going into the dumpster, and the leadership at the top has decided to do this, and that's going to change this, and everybody gets sucked into these constant news cycle narratives of the marketplace. In reality, where all the value is picked up for a better price is when things are in a lull or on a down cycle, you know, from collector cars to uh, excess of inventories of other warehouses to uh, staff. There's staff looking for jobs that you could cherry pick some great staff from other companies. But the best prepared business owners with the most cash in the bank and the most money back in them will pick up these uh, remnants of the ashes as the econ economy ebbs and flows. And that's where you need to be ready because the next downturn is always coming. Is that like buy low, sell high? Well, that's kind of that, but you need to be prepared. You, you, you want to get more aggressive when things are down. You want to be ready for that. You want to figure out how to get around all the hurdles that have been put in front of you for whatever reason it may be, you know, some trade war or some politician's decision or a tax issue. You want to be ready to take advantage of every opportunity that comes along at a discount during recession. How does that affect savings account? Uh and building up a savings so that you have some money left over for the rainy day. Well, you got to manage that, but, you know, when I was younger, you don't care about that. When you get older, you start worrying about that. But when you're younger, go for it. Go for it. Go down to basically where you're rolling quarters to pay your rent. If you got to, if it helps boost your company's uh, market share, you got to do that. We have two minutes left, and the number one entrepreneur item that you need, drum roll, please. You cannot manage people. You can only manage your agreement with them. Your word is everything you have. I added that part. That's true. That's that is true. true. Your word is important. Go ahead. That's true. You, you can't sit there and, and you have to lay it out for people what you expect from them. You, you just can't sit there and remind them. You, you just need to know what's expected. And when they let you down, you don't come at them with a, hey, you forgot to do this, or hey, why didn't you do that? You come at them and you say, hey, we had an agreement that you would perform on this and you did not do that. You start the conversation there and it's a radical uh, difference from uh, trying to manage them or micromanage is one word that's often used. But you want to just manage everything through agreements. And what about guilt? Sounds like you're kind of <laughs> guilting them. <laughs> no, no, you don't do that. You just you let them know when they don't, when they don't take out the trash or whatever it is. You know, you broke our agreement. You're supposed to call that customer back. And you didn't. We have about 40 seconds left, so my question is, how can people reach you, Tom? Uh, let's see. How could they reach me? I guess uh, Tom at anplumbing.com. A-N, like Army, Navy, plumbing, D-O-U-M-B-I-N-G.com. And you'll answer any questions? Yeah, if anybody needs any help, as long as, uh, as, long as they're a friend of yours or a friend of ours. All right, we'll have the engineer. He says he's got a lot of questions. He's also got a lot of issues, but all right. You listen to KHS 1220 and 98.1 FM with my co-host Tracy and our wonderful guest Tom Neely today. Thank you very much. Have a great week. Thank you for tuning in to the Ask Brian Radio Show. You can listen to us every Thursday on KTHS AM 1220 and FM 98.1 or via Facebook Live or anytime wherever you listen to your podcasts. Visit askbrian.com to join the conversation and ask us your business questions and we'll answer them on our next episode. That's askbrien.com.